um, thanks for having me back. It's a it's a great forum, and um, I'm I'm thrilled to present this project. I've called it Fast, Cheap, and Net Zero Passive House. Um, it, it's the, it's called the Sunflower Court Housing Project for Women and Children, and it's uh, based in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, you know, all of us that work in this passive house world are dedicated and, and get, get uh, you know, a, a certain amount of per personal fulfillment of doing our part for the planet. And for us, this project adds another layer of that, of, of doing our part for um, a really underserved population. So Add Some for Women and Children is a not-for-profit organization that uh, shelters and houses um, homeless and uh, women and children uh, or women and children that are coming from um, situations of domestic violence or, or uh, other types of, of problems that are leaving them uh, homeless, essentially. Um, and so they, they have a lot of programming uh, in addition to the housing, food, clothing, connections um, to try to stabilize the lives for this very underserved population. So it's really a great honor to be able to work on this project. It's um, the team is quite inspiring. Um, there's another not-for-profit organization called Affordable Housing Nova Scotia. They've been around since the mid eighties and they um, really advocate for these not-for-profits to help organize projects um, to help them find land, get development permitting done, um, and or help them organize funding. So they're a key uh, partner in this project. Um, Michael kind of introduced me already, but we're a Passive House uh, net zero design firm in Nova Scotia. There's 10 of us. Um, we provide uh, custom design. We're doing a lot of affordable housing projects um, in the last year. Um, we have our uh, Passive House stock plans and we do a lot of training and con construction support as well. To date, we've worked on over 250 passive house projects and um, I'm a year behind uh, Graham in, in uh, starting, but I, but I did the training um, in 2000 and not, did, did my certification in 2009. So way back in the early parts of passive house coming to North America. Let me see if I can get my... So the project goals, uh, 25 residential units, four of them um, requiring accessibility. Uh, you can see from the photo that the space that they currently have is pretty dark and, and dreary. It's actually an old school that was given to them by the city that they converted into shelter spaces. Uh, so they wanted something warm and bright. They want office space and community centers for their programming and the staff that support um, the, these families the construction had to be very affordable from a cost perspective. Uh, they wanted to pursue the passive house approach and achieve net zero with solar PV systems um, once we've reduced the energy in, in the building use. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of turnover in the occupancy. So durable exterior and interior finishes was also important from a design perspective. And a, a really interesting piece of wanting to foster security and community um, with with many of these um, clients coming from very bad domestic violence situations um, the housing needed to be to designed specifically to foster security uh, so that the the uh, housing is designed around a central courtyard and, and with a playground as a as a central point I just got to move all these faces so I can see my um, PowerPoint better. There we go. Uh, the funding of the project, the land was donated by HRM. As I mentioned, it was a uh, school built in the 50s um, that was decommissioned. Uh, the project was successful in applying for the Federal Rapid Housing Initiative. And um, this was a, a federal program um, with substantial funding, which often doesn't happen. Usually you get little bits and pieces. Um, and it had two main requirements that impacted the project. One was it required panelization or modular construction, and it, it required completion by March 31st, 2021. So um, just over a year um, to, to complete the construction. Um, they also uh, did a lot of fundraising for private donors and other government funding on the provincial level 
and they will receive a significant rebate from Efficiency Nova Scotia, which is the, the um, pardon me, organization in Nova Scotia that, that uses um, money collected from our utility bills to foster energy efficiency um, in the province. We've been really, the pro project is really challenged by uh, COVID cost increases. And um, we finally actually just got the last piece of uh, announcement from the last piece of funding. They had a private donor for $972,000 today, which was what they were short to um, get the project started. So they, they just um, basically gave the go ahead today to start the construction. Uh, from a design perspective, uh, site considerations, this is just kind of a, a representation. There was an already cleared pa uh, pad on the site and we wanted to leave the forested area uh, where we could. Um, we wanted to design around the existing site grades to keep the costs down. There was, there's already an existing driveway and parking lot um, that we're, we're using. Um, we've oriented for Solar South, which is actually to the off to the side of the property line here. We wanted to create that privacy and security. So like there's there's no, all of the entry doors open into the courtyard. There's no entry doors that open in, in uh, off into the back of the, of each of the buildings. And um, that courtyard has a, has a playground, a community laundry um, and a, a smoking um, structure. Central parking and garbage are going to be located at the back of the building, um, so that it's not uh, into, into, integral to the to the um, entrances and the feeling of community in in the buildings. So we want to make it cheap to build, and we um, started that really early in the process. So uh, we had a really cooperative structural engineer who really gets what we're working to do. So one of the things that we did right off was reduce the frost wall or in the States, I think we call it a stem wall um, from eight inch thickness down to six. So we reduced the concrete requirements for the walls by 25%, which also results in less embodied energy. Um, we designed the building with bearing on the roofs front to back so that we could eliminate the bearing under the demising walls between units. And we were able to just use a ladder of steel within the, in the slab itself um, and expansion cuts without having to put another frost wall under, under these demising walls. Gives us less thermal bridging, again, less concrete and less cost. Um, I don't know what everybody else is experiencing, but we're finding that the truss manufacturers, if they do the engineering on a project that says engineer the trusses for a solar system, they completely oversize the roof trusses and that adds to the cost of the, the, the truss package. Uh, so we had our structural engineer do that sizing to avoid that tendency of the manufacturers just to oversize everything. Uh, I mentioned we designed the roof uh, front to back and using a gable. So we're reducing uh, siding quantities compared to using shed roofs. Um, we are using a valley set uh, to create this uh, gable, perpendicular gable. And there, um, we all, this is actually south. So the, the gable roof works well for our orientation for solar panels. Um, it's designed that they're going to construct the, the, the roof um, structure on the ground and crane it into place to help uh, also control the cost and make it a little faster. From an assembly perspective, uh, w w it's really important that we're using locally available materials um, that are easy to access and familiar to the trades um, to control costs and uh, to keep things moving quickly uh, on the construction side. A roof assembly, very simple, uh, just a stick frame roof trusses with blown in cellulose. Cellulose is manufactured about 100 kilometers from the site. Um, and we use a raised heel, of course, to prevent uh, the thermal bridging at the corner. We're using a double stud with foam insulation in between. I call it the Sydney wall because we started using this, this wall in response to a project we built in, in uh, 
Sydney where, where you can still buy uh, an existing home for under $100,000. So we had a really fine ways to cut costs on the construction. So the truss wall got traded in for the double stud wall. The frost wall has all the insulation on the inside. Um, which eliminates the need for purging or metal flashing on insulation on, uh, covering on the outside. And again, we engineered that wall thickness down to six inches. Um, and we have a frost wall only on the perimeter of the building, as I mentioned, and not having to uh, use these frost walls ac across all the demising walls. The slab is pretty simple. We have two layers of type two EPS for our value of 21. And our, again, we put our reinfor reinforcing in the slab rather than a thickened edge or a, uh, or a frost wall under the stair bearing and the um, demising walls. By running the roofs front to back on the frost walls and only carrying the, flo the floor loads on the demising walls, um, that kept the load small enough not to require anything but a, a ladder of structural steel in, in the slab. On the energy efficiency, um, because they are larger buildings, we can thin out the assemblies from, from what we see in single family homes. Um, we uh, use the sensitivity testing during energy modeling to really optimize the balance of our insulation levels um, with the cost of solar panels. Um, and we've designed for really simple airtight details to achieve our airtightness without a, a whole bunch of uh, extra site detailing. Uh, we have sharing hot water heat pumps between two one bedroom units uh, to keep the capital costs down. Uh, we're, we've designed the windows to be installed in the weather resistive barrier plane rather than halfway um, through the wall. Um, just a, uh, I know there's a small energy penalty to doing so, but it allows us to, um, to install them in, in a method that, that the trades are super familiar with and, and there's no extra flashing and, and drain sill pans required to, to make that work. Uh, we're using a vinyl passive house rated window from Coltec, which is also manufactured about 100 uh, kilometers from the site. Uh, and they also uh, stepped up with a significant upgrade to the window package. Um, as well as uh, a cash donation to the organization to help um, make this project uh, um, uh, viable from the financial side. Uh, heat pumps were cut from the budget and uh, we ended up using the energy model to optimize the design to reduce cooling loads because there is no cooling in the buildings. Um, and this, um, yeah, uh, it was about 25, we looked at the Minotaur, which most people I'm sure are familiar with, which is the HRV heating cooling combination unit, which, which are really great for small units. Um, they can, their capacity works quite well for apartment size um, uh, applications, but we did not, um, it was about 250,000 extra to, to implement, implement those. So they got cut during the budget. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the heating system decision. We are in a heating dominated climate. I'm just going to spin back here again for a second. Red is space heating. Um, blue is space cooling. So you can see our energy balance is heavily weighted towards space heating. We could have made a big impact by using heat pumps here um, in the energy model. Um, but the, dis the discussion was really interesting. Um, we, we really didn't have uh, the, the funds in the budget to use a ducted heat, heat pump system. Uh, and often we'll use electric baseboards with a single ductless mini split. And there was a lot of discussion with the project team that uh, the likelihood of these clients using a heat pump when they could just turn the knob on the electric baseboards was, was, was a risk. So even though the model says we could do really well with heat pumps, there was a real question whether the clients would actually use the heat pumps or just basically heat their units with the, with the electric baseboards, losing that um, COP on the performance. Um, it's possible, we know from other projects that um, tenants and, and uh, that aren't paying the energy bills themselves can use more, 
more cooling than necessary in the summertime, leave the windows open and run the air conditioning at the same time. Uh, the occupants in these units, many of them have, are living on the street. So the idea of having to um, have ongoing training and user calls on how to operate the system with that high turnover in the occupancy um, was also uh, identified as a, as a risk uh, in going with a, a more complicated to operate uh, heating and cooling system. It was felt that the tenants would default to the simpl simplest way to maintain comfort. Um, these folks are not your custom home energy geeks. And uh, so we decided to uh, use electric baseboards and we changed the windows to low solar heat gain um, glass so that we minimized uh, the cooling requirement and know that we're gonna need a few more solar panels to pay for the electric baseboards. There was also, um, this is a small organization that, that uh, has to cover the installation cost of the equipment, but also the ongoing maintenance um, costs and call, call user questions. So uh, electric baseboards was the, the decision on the heating system. Um, and we'll see wh whether um, we, we will, we're considering roughing in the, uh, the um, disconnect for electrical that as a heat pump could be added in the future if the climate continues to heat up. Um, so a few strategies to speed up the construction uh, that really helped on our construction schedule in meeting that March 31st, 2022 deadline that was attached to the funding. Uh, the the uh, design team was, was extremely decisive. We went from start to final conducts in six months and we started pricing in about four and a half months. Um, we were very fortunate that the city uh, had buy-in um, to this project right from the beginning and we had unheard of turnaround times on inquiries and permit approvals. They, they rezoned the lot in two days, which, you know, uh, which is just unheard of um, for, for most municipalities. We have panelization, so the walls can be built while the groundwork is underway. Uh, it was, uh, even though uh, the design wasn't done by the builder, the builder was involved uh, in all the design uh, meetings and pricing options very early. So we were kept on track from a cost perspective during the design. Again, using that, that simple building shape and details um, is good for energy efficiency, but it's also good for controlling uh, costs and the speed of construction. Uh, all locally available materials that, um, that, are, that we can buy at any building supply place, uh, the only exception probably being the HRV. And we did use the most efficient Canadian HRV that's available on the market. We did not use a, a German made uh, HRV again for cost. There's one sewer electrical and water connections for all buildings, it's one owner. Um, and we, we decided to, that, that they will be the owner for the, the long term with this building. So it cuts, their, cuts the uh, compl complication for services to the building. Um, sorry. Uh, and we had the civil engineer um, make some on the fly changes to the finished floor height to work around site bedrock instead of having to, um, to blast on the site. And we're involved in construction support, which we hope will help them moving quickly in implementing the passive house strategies that are part of the design. Um, so I think the key elements in thinking about the project um, of what made it fast, cheap to get to passive house and net zero um, was the, there was a highly collaborative project team, really no ego in that project team. I think it's the first time there's 11 people on, on the design project team. I think first time ever for me um, that the majority were women, of the 11, eight were women on the project team. Um, we found ourselves some smart structural, civil and electrical engineers that really bought into our energy goals on the project and the cost goals as well, keeping things simple. Again, reiterating that, that uh, simple building shape um, more energy efficient, more cost effective and quicker to build. Um, bringing our experience on, on affordable passive house projects 
um, to the team, I think was really valuable in, in limiting those design options really early on. So instead of going down the road and then realizing that this thing wouldn't meet the energy goals or wouldn't meet the cost goals, um, was, a, was a big help in, in getting the design finished quickly. We use the energy model very early on um, to inform our strategies and to uh, test the sensitivity of where we should stop with our passive host strategies and um, uh, invest in solar panels as a more cost-effective option. Um, I didn't show you a site, a site plan, but um, we limited the buildings to part nine building code. That will mean something to Canadians, but for our, Amer for our other world friends, um, there is two major building codes in Canada. One applies to commercial and applies to residential. And the requirements are much more stringent, like sprinklers, um, a bunch of more fire regulations and so forth that apply to commercial. So we, we broke um, the 37,000 square feet into 6,000 uh, 6, uh, square foot um, buildings that will allow us to stay in, depart, in part nine of the building code. We're using panelization, as I mentioned, and locally available materials and equipment. Uh, so that is uh, the end of my presentation. Um, I have no idea how I did on time tonight, but there you have it. Um, and I will leave it there for questions.